With a Wi-Fi enabled microcontroller board, you have the opportunity to create some fantastic graphical web-based control panels. These allow you to both monitor and control devices on your MicroPython project. So let me show you how that's done. Hi and welcome to Bytes and Bits. In the past few tutorials, we've been having a look at building up a web control panel for a MicroPython project which was running on a Raspberry Pi Pico. Uh, but this could of course be used for an ESP32 or anything really that has a Wi-Fi connection. And in the previous episodes then, and if you haven't seen those, do check out the description down below where I'll put links to those episodes. Uh, but in those previous episodes then, we built up our Wi-Fi connection, we then built up a web server, and in the previous tutorial, we built up an asynchronous web server, which allows us to um, run our web server code in parallel then with our Raspberry Pi Pico application so that we don't have any timing issues where our web server in effect blocks up our application from running. So in this tutorial, uh, we're going to be looking at the actual web page code. So this is the code which is going to run on our web browser, which of course will be either our, our mobile phone or, or anything else which really has a web browser. And we're going to be using some HTML and some JavaScript code. And that will, of course, be served by our um, Raspberry Pi Pico, our, our MicroPython project. So we'll start by having a quick overview of where all these bits of software sit in the system and how they communicate. And then we'll get into the actual coding itself. So our basic setup involves our microcontroller board being connected to a client browser over a Wi-Fi network. And that will usually be provided by our router. Um, but as we saw, we can actually set our microcontroller board to generate its own Wi-Fi network. And in that case, our client browser will connect directly to our Pi Pico. Now, from a software point of view, our um, microcontroller is going to be running MicroPython, and that will have our web server, which as we've seen, we've enabled that then with an API system. We then have on our client a browser running, and this is where we have to start thinking about the browser not just being something that's going to view what our Pico is doing, but actually its own computer system in itself. So when our browser first connects to our MicroPython web server, it's going to ask for the code for our web page. And our MicroPython then is going to send back basically HTML files and some JavaScript files. And these are files which then run on our browser. And this is again where I said, those are actually code files and which will actually contain software. And that software then runs on our browser. And that allows us then to offload a lot of our um, control panel rendering code down to the browser itself. So our actual MicroPython application now, all we will be using that for is to respond to these API calls, which are really gonna be quite simple commands where it's asking for various bits of data from our application. That will then come down to our browser and all of the fancy bits of drawing dials and graphs and um, outputting the screen display, we'll actually then delegate that to our browser client machine and do all the hard work down there. So just before we get to the code itself, um, we're going to be using a little test circuit in this tutorial. And this is the same one I used in the previous tutorial. Uh, so we've got a Raspberry Pi Pico that's connected then to a potentiometer. And we're going to use that then to get some feedback from the Pico uh, um, on the reading for this um, particular device. We've then got a little red LED, which we're going to be using to control from our application software running on the Pico. So that's going to be running in parallel then with our web server. And we then have three colored LEDs, our, our blue, yellow, and green ones here. And we're going to be able to control those then from buttons on our control panel. So this will give us um, just a little bit of circuitry to play around with. Now, all of the actual circuit diagrams, as you can see on the screen at the moment, um, those are in the 
web page that goes along with this tutorial. So if you look in the description below on the Bison Bits website, you'll see every, every tutorial I produce, there is a full web page just taking you through um, and giving you all the information that you need for that. So to please do refer to that um, to build up a similar circuit then for your own testing. You also notice that there is a NeoPixel strip, um, which is the strip at the bottom of the image there, which is covered with masking tape so that it doesn't bleach out the camera whenever it's turned on. So then in this first stab at doing a control panel, and we won't be using that, but later in the tutorial, we'll be bringing in um, sort of a lot more graphic controls on our control panel. And at that point, you'll, you'll see that in action, uh, but more of that later. To create our web control panel, we need a number of files that will be stored on the MicroPython device. First, we need the Python file, or, or it could be a number of files, that contain our web server code, together with any application code. Then, we need a range of files that create a mini website that our PyPico will serve back to our client browser. The files I'm creating for this tutorial will all be available as a GitHub repository, so please make sure that you check the description or visit the main project page on my website for a link to all that code. Now you're also going to need some way of editing HTML and JavaScript files. If you're using PyCharm as I am here, then that's all built into the main editor. But if not, then you're going to need at least a plain text editor to be able to create and manipulate these files. First then, we need to look at the Python code file. Now this contains the code for our web server, the API within it, and our project code. Now naturally you can spread this over a number of files, but in this tutorial, I just put everything into the one place. So looking inside the file, you'll see that there are two main code blocks. The first is our web server request handler. And this is identical to the code that we developed in the previous tutorial. So, so again, if you haven't watched those videos, then please do have a look. So in this request handler, we use a number of the helper classes we've been developing. And again, you'll need the files for those to be uploaded onto your PyPico as well. Now, initially, we get the raw request that's sent by the client browser over our Wi-Fi connection. We then run this through our request parser class, and that will decode all of the information and present it to us in a standardized format. Now this allows us to send our API requests from our client in a range of formats. For example, we can use a simple get request. Um, as we'll see in this episode, then we're gonna be using some post requests with form data, or we could use a post request with some JSON data. I say so those are the two we're gonna look at in this first one. Now, once we have that request, we prepare a response object, and that's gonna contain the data that we need to send back to our client browser. So after that, we then need to work out what the client has requested and to take the appropriate action. So in this setup, I've created two types of request. One will be a call to our API endpoint, where our Pico will need to interact with our test circuit. And the other then will be a request for one of the static code files that make up the actual web control panel. So in this first part of the code, you can see that we are testing for a call to the API endpoint, and we're checking that request URL parameter. So our API expects to be sent a data variable called action, and that specifies what API code we want to run. So the first action that I've coded is this read pot. Now this is a request from the client for the current setting of the potentiometer. Now, as you can see in the code, it simply reads the voltage from the potentiometer and places that value as a simple string in the body of the response. Now there are a range of ways in which you can package your data to be sent back to the client, and this is the simplest way. In our second action, set LED color, we have a more complex call. So here, our client needs to send a data value that specifies the color of the LED that needs to be turned on. So once we have that color value, we build a small object using a Python dictionary that holds the current state of all three LEDs. 
We then turn on the correct LED and log this in our LED color state structure. Now, now this example is designed to show how we can return complex data back to our client web browser. So our response data is, a for, is, a, is another Python dictionary inside which we can embed whatever variables we want. So the first data attribute is one called status, which is used to hold a simple string which indicates if the API call ran OK or if it caused an error. The second data attribute embeds our whole LED state variable into our return data. Now this is going to be returned to the client as a JSON object and that um, JSON is designed to allow complex data structures to be sent as simple text messages between servers and clients. So you can see at the end of this API action handler, we call the set body from dict um, method, which takes our Python dictionary translates it into a JSON string that represents that complex data structure and then embeds that into the body of our response. Now at the moment, um, these are the only two API actions that I've implemented. If we get an API call for an unrecognized action, we're just simply going to return an HTTP error code. Now, if our request was not to the API endpoint, our code now assumes that the client is asking for one of the static files that make up our web page. So we make a call to the serve static file method, passing in the requested URL, and also then specifying what file we should use if no URL is requested. So that this is called the default page, and it's basically the home page of our application website. Now the rest of the code in this file handles the actual setting up of the asynchronous tasks, as well as launching some application code, which will run on the second core of our Raspberry Pi Pico. Now for this tutorial, all, all our application code is gonna do is to toggle the red LED on and off. And that just simply shows that we do have some application software running in parallel with our web API. So that really takes care of the MicroPython end of our web control panel. As we saw earlier, it's serving static code files and then handling our API requests with very simple data transfers between the browser and our web server. So we now need to have a look at the static code files that will be served to our client browser. Now I've split the code for the control panel web page into three parts. The HTML file is the first file that will be served when the client requests the web page. So this HTML code will then tell the browser to request the JavaScript code file and the CSS file containing some page styling. Now you, you could put everything into a single HTML file, but splitting it out into separate parts makes it a bit easier to see what's going on. And that's especially true as your project gets bigger and you start to have more complex structures. Now, I'm not really going to go into great detail on how to code web pages, but I will take you through the specific techniques that we need to use to communicate with our MicroPython web API and to display and control aspects of our project. So if we start looking through our HTML code, um, I'm, I'm using here some tables and buttons to create the control panel interface. Now, one of the good things about using PyCharm is that we can preview our work and see what it looks like by opening up the code in a browser. Now, as you can see, we've got a button which will take a reading from the Pico potentiometer and display it on the control panel. And we then have four buttons to turn on the relevant colored LED along with a final orange button that should return back an error. Now underneath these buttons is a colored block which will show the color of the currently on LED. And we're gonna set the color for that using the return data from our API call rather than just uh, monitoring the button presses on the JavaScript end. Now in the code, um, we will need some way of identifying and linking with these objects on our control panel. So if we first of all look at the read potentiometer button, you'll see that we are using an on click event handler to call a JavaScript function get reading from Pico. Now, now the code for this function will be stored in our JavaScript file to keep it nice and packaged over there. Now underneath this button, I'm using an 
HTML H2 tag to display the potentiometer reading. Now in my JavaScript, I will need to be able to reference this element. So I'm using the ID attribute of the H2 tag to effectively label it. Um, and that labels that element and then allows us to select it from within our JavaScript code. Now there are a range of ways in which you can label elements um, using CSS styles, data attributes, and so on. Um, so just use the one that best matches with how you would want to work. Now, now moving down the listing, we can see another four buttons, and each of those is then using its on-click event to call the set LED color JavaScript function. And again, each one of these is passing in its own desired color as the function parameter. Now, now finally then, I'm using another button to show the color of the currently active LED. Again, you can see either I've used the ID attribute to allow me to identify this element, but this time I'm using CSS classes, which control the style of an object, to control the state and color of this button. Now, as we mentioned earlier, this HTML file instructs the client web browser to request the CSS style file and the JavaScript code file. And you can see these being included in the link tag at the top of the code listing and then the script tag at the bottom. So that's enough of the HTML side of things. Uh, let's move over now to the JavaScript file. In this file then, I've defined the two functions that we reference from our HTML code. Now, I've used two different techniques for accessing the web API, just so you can see how the calls are structured. Now in this first get reading from Pico function, we're going to send some form data to the Pico. So you can see that I'm building that up in the first two lines of the function, where I'm creating an object to hold the form data, and I then append an action attribute with the value read pot. So that's gonna be the one which is decoded at the Pico end to tell it that we want to use the read pot API action. After that then, we are actually creating our AJAX call to the web API. Now, if, if you haven't come across AJAX before, this is a way in which our JavaScript code can communicate with the web server in the background while your browser is displaying the web page. So it's gonna generate a web request, send its data to the web server, receive a response from the web server, and then it will allow us to run a block of code, which can basically do whatever you want. So in our instance, we're going to decode the potentiometer reading and update our web page display with that value. Now the great advantage of using AJAX techniques is that our web page does not need to be refreshed. We can simply change the contents of the, of the page using code in the background. So our AJAX request then is implemented using an HTML HTTP request object. Now th there is also a newer fetch API for JavaScript, which does a very similar job, um, but it's really personal choice then as to which one you use. But going back to our HTML HTTP request, we then need to set a few properties. Now the onload property lets us set a function that will be called when we receive the response back from the web server. And, and, and these are called callback functions. So in the code, you can see that we're using the document.getElementById method to select the h2 tag that we labeled as reading using its id attribute. We then set its inner HTML property to the body of the response returned by the web API. Remember, the body of the response was just a string representation of our potentiometer reading. So in this onload callback function, the this object, as you can see in the code, that refers to the response that was returned by the web API. So the response text attribute gives us the body of the response. As we said, that is just a simple string representing the potentiometer reading. Now our second set LED color function is going to use JSON to both send our data to the web API and then to receive it back. So our code starts by building up a JavaScript object with the data that we want to send to our API. 
So you can see again that we set an action variable with our set LED color command. And we then attach a second variable to specify the color that we want. So again, because we are using JSON, we can actually use complex objects um, such as JavaScript objects, arrays, and really whatever other type of variable that we want within this data package. And that then that data structure in our JavaScript object will be rebuilt into JSON, sent over to our web API, picked up by our MicroPython, and then reconstructed back as an identical object in our MicroPython code. And that then gives us full access to the objects and in the same structure that we create them here on the JavaScript side. So, after that then, we then build up our Ajax call, and that's done in a very similar way to before. So here, our onload callback function is a bit more complex. So again, we're grabbing hold of the response body, but this time we know that it contains a JSON data structure. So we're gonna use the json.parse method in JavaScript to translate this string version of our data into an actual JavaScript object. And again, as we said, that will just simply rebuild whatever we'd put in our MicroPython dictionary and the same structure as that, it now rebuilds it as a JavaScript object which mimics that structure. So in our onload function, we first turn off the background color of our colored LED display button. And as you can see, I do that by simply removing all of the colored CSS style settings and then adding a CSS style to make the button look like it's turned off. And again, we'll look at these styles in just a second when we cover the CSS file. So we then use the um, CLED states object that was embedded in the MicroPython end of our web API. And that's put into the response then to check and we use that then to check the color of each of the individual LEDs. So if a color status is turned on, then we set the correct CSS style for that colored LED display button. And again, this means that the color that we display is actually coming back from our web API and not just because we've clicked the buttons and are using JavaScript for that. Now, in this, in this handler then, you can see that we have a big if statement. Um, and that, as you can see, checks the status value which is returned in our response object. So again, if that's set to OK, we handle the LED color states because we know that everything's gone OK. Otherwise, we raise an error message using this little alert function. Now, the last part of this function is what turns this AJAX request into a JSON AJAX request. So again, we're gonna be using a post method and a call to our API endpoint. But this time we need to set the content type request header to specify that we are sending JSON data. Now, this will be picked up by our MicroPython API code so that it knows to decode the request body as a JSON object. Now, the final line of our function takes our JavaScript data object, JSON data, which we created earlier on. And remember that just simply has a data structure with all the data we want in that. And then this turns it into JSON text. So remember JSON is a text version of our object structure. And then that is sent across as the body of our request. So again, once we pick it up on the MicroPython side, we will decode it from that JSON text, and we will then have a, a Python object which mimics the data structure we have created here. And again, that, that is the main power of using JSON, is that we can very easily communicate complex data structures from one side of our connection to the other. So that's the code that's running within our browser. The, the, the final bit of this web page package then is the CSS style file. And if we just have a quick look through that, you'll see that all I'm doing here is I'm simply defining the various background colors for that colored LED display button. By applying and removing these in the correct order, we can very easily control the look of objects in our web page. So, all of this then should now give us a working web control panel for our MicroPython project. 
So let's hook up to our PyPico and see if all this works. So we're now running our CP Simple um, application. And as you can see, we've got our control panel here and I'm connected up to my Wi-Fi network and I'm just reading directly from the Raspberry Pi Pico. So if we um, have a go here, so if we click the read pot, that should send an API request to our Pi Pico, which will then send us back a text message which will have the value of the pot. And again, if I if I just move that around a bit and, and click on that, we'll see that we get the actual then potentiometer reading value coming back. Our buttons on the bottom here then, again, each one of those then should control a particular LED on our board. Each of those three colors then, say as we click the button, it will send that color value up to our Pi Pico. Our Pi Pico will then turn the correct LED on and then send us back a data object which will have the information as to which LED was turned on. So the color that we get displayed here is then of course being controlled by the message coming back from our Pi Pico. Our last button orange here um, is designed to give us the error message. So we click on that that is detected as an error by the web API, coming back then as, an, as a status which is error status, and we get our little alert message coming up. So that's pretty much then um, our control panel, all the elements that we have or, or that we need to both send information and receive information back from our API and then manipulate our web page to display that information correctly. Now, obviously, at the moment, we're using a very basic um, control panel. So let's try pepping that up a bit and making it into a nice user friendly system. The full demo then for this system is on the GitHub repository as well, underneath this API full set of um, files up here. So if we have a look through the code for that, the, the Python file then, so the full demo.py, um, you'll see that that is pretty much identical to what it was with the previous one. Um, we've got our request handler here. We obviously have a few more API actions set up in the system, but they're all using exactly the same structure as before. And again, here we're more standardizing on the JSON in, JSON out um, structure, um, which again, gives us much more flexibility as to the complexity of the data that can go between our browser and our MicroPython side of things. Down the bottom then, we are running um, a number of concurrent tasks here. So on the asynchronous side, we're obviously running our web server, but we also have an asynchronous task running in parallel with that, which is going to toggle our LED on and off. And we're then using, um, if I go down the bottom here, you'll see that we use a, a, the, the second core. So this, this, there, this then is multi-core programming here, where we are running this new pixels updating routine. And you'll see that in a second. Uh, and that's going to, in the background then, as, as a separate um, task on the second core, that is going to be um, cycling colors through on our uh, a new pixel strip. So in fact, we now have our, our web server, our toggling our LED and our NeoPixels. We have three concurrent tasks running in this system. Um, but as you saw here, we're, we're not doing anything more complex than we were before. Where we are upping the complexity, though, of course, is on the browser side. So if we have a look at our um, HTML file. Now, one of the big powerful things with going to a web-based control panel is that um, we probably have access to the internet. Now, the, the previous system, all the files and code were stored actually on our MicroPython controller, so on our Raspberry Pi Pico, and they were being delivered directly from that. It wasn't using anything from the web at all. And, and that's great, um, especially if you are built using the AP mode where the um, Pi Pico is generating its own Wi-Fi network and you're hooking into that so that you're not relying on having an external router or, or an external Wi-Fi network in the presence. You can just simply log directly onto the Pi Pico. Um, but obviously at that point, everything you need must be contained within your Pi Pico. Um, otherwise, it's not going to work.
But in, in general, we will be connected to an internet enabled Wi-Fi network. And that's what we're using in this one. We're, we're assuming that that's the case we're in. And at that point, we can start to pull in packages from anywhere on the web. So one of the ones I'm using here is something called Bootstrap, which is a, a CSS framework, which basically when we use that, it instantly makes our web page look a lot better. So it has um, ready-made styles for buttons that sort of rounds off the corners and, and gives them nice sort of animation effects and so on. And it's very it makes it very easy and quick to build up a very good looking web page. So again, I'm pulling that in from its um, content delivery network here, which again is in some sort of web access. Uh, I'm pulling that in. We can also then start to use other packages. So if we look down here, um, if, if, I, if, I, if I quickly show you what the final um, web page is going to look like. So this is, this is what we're heading towards here, where we've got nice styling, nice fonts. Our buttons look good. They hover with them there. As we click them, they, we, we get our nice effects. We have slider controls and we have our gauges. So, so all of this is being created on our browser, just using the information coming back from our web API calls. So you can see that we're on our HTML, then we're obviously building that up. And again, the packages that you use, you will have to read through the manuals to work out how they actually work. But I'm using a package called gauge.js. Um, and you can see here that I'm actually going to, if I scroll down the bottom here, you'll see it being imported in. That's one that I actually have downloaded from the website and embedded that into my Raspberry Pi Pico. And you'll see it sitting there in, in the file list of what's on the Pico itself. Uh, so again, that is one that you could use on the individual or the AP mode where we are creating its own Wi-Fi network. But you also see then that I'm bringing in some other stuff. So this is the other half of the bootstrap. That's the JavaScript side of the bootstrap. I'm also then using a package called jQuery, which again is another quite large download. It's a few hundred kilobytes. And again, I'm pulling that in directly from the jQuery website. And that makes it much easier for me to work with the um, elements on my web page. Um, there's something called a document object model, which in effect um, is an object that represents everything that is on your web page and this makes it much much easier to interact with that but again you will have to work out how to use that and if you look through my code you'll see various instances in there where, where those um, calls are taking place so, so that's our HTML there and as I say that bringing in the power of the web to be able to bring in um, incredibly powerful packages um, if we then look at our JavaScript so we have our JavaScript coming in here. Again, you'll see that um, all that's happening in here is that we have obviously a, a, a large number of, of actions and, and um, button options that we are, we are using. We're now using a lot more of the um, jQuery code to interact with our um, page elements. And you can see here, we've got some of our um, gauge code um, sitting there. And again, all, all of this is detailed out in the gauge documentation about how to set it up to have various pointers and limits and color zones and, and so on. But you can see here that this allows us to build up very complex um, displays, but all of the processing is being handled by our web browser and not by our Raspberry Pi Pico. So for these dials and gauges, if I go back across to that, these dials and gauges, we could be using our Pico to generate a graphic image which represents this gauge with the pointer in the correct position, but that would just over, that would just be too much for our Pico to have to reproduce. So we're simply sending back the value 71 and our browser is going to generate and draw this graphic for us. And we're passing all that information back there. And again, we, we could extend that idea out even further where perhaps we might be running some sort of maybe face recognition software um, or, or, or some sort of AI information on our browser, 
our PICO then is simply gathering the data that's being fed into that AI system and our AI system then can take various actions upon that. It could even send some of those actions back out to our Raspberry Pi and, and perhaps have it um, maybe avoiding some objects if we've got some sort of robot going around and so on. Now, obviously, if we are offloading processing onto our browser, then we do have a time delay from the information being picked up by our Raspberry Pi Pico. It then has to send that back down to our browser using an HTTP um, uh, message. Our browser then has to process that and then re-communicate the actions back up to our Pi Pico. So if we were doing some sort of robotics and, and collision, of, of, collision avoidance, then obviously um, that would we would have to take that time delay into account. And obviously it's, it's not uh, an insignificant time delay in that full round trip. So, so, so do bear that in mind. But again, the, the principle of offloading some of the heavy lifting of data analysis um, is, is there and can be done, again, if you take into account how it fits in with your overall, overall system. But that then is our control panel. Um, as you can see here, if I move my potentiometer on the, on the Pico, we can see that our dial then comes there, and again, I've I've color zoned this so as our this this could be some sort of reading coming in maybe um, from a position it's getting close to an object and then we have into a danger zone and so on. The the temperature setting here is coming off the inbuilt temperature sensor on our Raspberry Pi Pico, so at the moment it's running at. Um, well, 29 degrees, which, which again, the, these color zones, I just made them up. So it, it's, it's still perfectly valid for our processor to be running at that, at that um, temperature. Our, our colored LEDs, then you can see here that we've got a nice big um, display and we can then do that. And again, the, the Pico itself is, of course, um, re responding to that. And then our, our, our colored RGBs. Um, let, 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 let me actually just go out and actually bring the bring the Pico's display in here as well. So that, that's the um, circuit now live on on this system as well. So again, as our colored LEDs, you can see here that we've still got all of that working there for us on, on that side of things. We then got our RGBs. So we um, have a task running inside the um, Pico, which is cycling the color on these four um, LED um, Neo pixels. So those are the right hand for LED pixels. And you should see that the colors on the control panel are matching up with the colors of the pixels on there. And again, that is information being sent back from our Pi Pico. It, it's running those LEDs um, within its own control system. And we're just simply monitoring them on our web panel. The other four NeoPixels, they're eight on that stack there. Again, we're using these sliders then to control them and we can slide these around. So again, these are components from Bootstrap and we can then adjust those to bring in whatever colors we want for our, our NeoPixels. So again, giving us much more complex control of our project all through the use of this web control panel. So um, hopefully you can see that there is a lot of scope here uh, for building a really good user interface for your project. Again, it does rely on there being Wi-Fi access, so there are only certain microcontrollers that this will work with. But once you do get into that, you can see here that um, it does open up a wide range of possibilities, including that ability then to offload processing of some complex data onto your browser, which of course is a very powerful system if you think about our modern our modern browsers, they, um, they can do a hell of a lot of processing on there. So I hope that has given you everything you need. Um, I said the full tutorial series takes you right from the very beginnings of setting up your Wi-Fi connection all the way through to where we are now with a full graphic web control panel. So I hope that has opened up some possibilities for you. Um, if you are enjoying what I'm doing, please do click that like button, subscribe to the channel and hit that notification bell for when the next videos are coming out. Um, I hope you get on well producing your own 
MicroPython based projects. I look forward to seeing you again in a video very soon and bye for now. For more games programming, electronics projects and retro gaming, please make sure you like this video, subscribe to my YouTube channel and visit my website.